Do zero-day exploits and supply chain attacks keep you up at night? Worry no more, you can harden your security with ThreatLocker. Imagine taking a proactive, denied-by-default approach to cybersecurity, blocking every action, process, and user, unless specifically authorized by your team. ThreatLocker helps you do this and provides a full audit of every action, allowed or blocked, for risk management and compliance. Onboarding and operation is fully supported by their U.S.-based support team. Stop the exploitation of trusted applications within your organization to keep you running efficiently and secure, protected from ransomware. Worldwide, companies like JetBlue trust ThreatLocker to secure their data and keep their business operations flying high. To learn more about how ThreatLocker can mitigate unknown threats and ensure compliance for your organization, visit ThreatLocker.com. Welcome to the Philip Wiley Show. Take a look behind the curtain of professional hacking and hear compelling discussions with guests from diverse backgrounds who share a common curiosity and passion for challenges and their job. And now, here's your host, offensive security professional, educator, mentor, and author, Philip Wiley. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Philip Wiley Show. Today I'm being joined by Rob Allen from ThreatLocker. So it'll be interesting to see uh, what he has to share about their product. Uh, they do some some pretty interesting things, really cool tool. Uh, recently just found out about them and I had the pleasure of speaking with some of the folks from ThreatLocker last week at the New York Cybersecurity Summit, kind of hearing about some of the details. And so I look forward to getting to dig a little deeper into that but first off, let's uh, welcome our guest to the show. Welcome, Rob. Thank you, Philip. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, great to have you. Thank Love you. The accent. Love the accent. <laughs> My Michigan <laughs> accent, you mean? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny you say that because I was watching your episode with Daniel Meisler on unsupervised learning, and I thought that was kind of funny how you said it, your, <laughs> your, your Midwest accent. So yeah. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, so uh, how are things going with you guys uh, fourth quarter of uh, the year? How are things going? Um, never a quiet day, to be perfectly honest, Philip. Uh, obviously, moving at breakneck, breakneck speed, creating new products, new features, everything. It, it's never ending, I suppose. But it's a, it's a great problem to have. It's a great problem to have. Yeah, with this rapidly evolving threat landscape we have, as technology evolves, it gets more difficult to protect. So mm. definitely need uh, companies with products like yours out there to help. Well, I suppose to some extent, it, it, and I know we may get into this a little bit, but the approach that we take, the default and I approach that we take, means that we typically don't have to respond to individual threats or tactics and so on. Now, obviously, there are exceptions to that, and there's always things we can do better, we can improve. But generally speaking, it's not as if, you know, new threat comes out, we have to respond to it immediately, because typically, we're going to block the thing or stop the thing anyway. Um, but as I said, that's not to say that there aren't improvements and, and, you know, optimizations and everything else that we can make to the product, because there's always something. Yeah, there's always more lessons to learn. So mm -hmm. uh, before we get too far into the conversation, if you wouldn't mind sharing your hacker origin story, kind of how you started out and what you do for ThreatLocker. Um, so, and I know people are going to find this hard to believe with my boyish good looks and, and live frame, but I've been working in the IT game for best, well, over a quarter of a century now. Um, I spent the best part of 20 years working for a MSP in Ireland. So basically managing customers' environments, about two or 300 different environments around the country we manage the IT for. Um, the way I like to see it, so most of that was pretty smooth sailing, but probably the last four or five years of it, so maybe from 2016 to 2021, um, we definitely saw in very real terms the um, emergence of the threat of ransomware. Um, so as I'm sure you know, for a long time, you know, viruses were really not that big a deal. They'd send out some spam emails or they might, you know, pop up some stuff in your computer, but realistically, they weren't really that big a deal. As I said, over the last four or five years of I my mean, working for that company, we very much became aware of ransomware being a thing. I mean, we probably ended up cleaning up somewhere between a dozen, maybe dozen to 15 ransomware attacks per year. Um, it 
got to the stage where I'm pretty much sitting there, my phone rings on a Monday morning at eight o'clock and I'm going, oh, Jesus, who's been hit now or who's who's been affected now? So the way I like to think of it is I've gone from cleaning up the effects of ransomware attacks to with threat locker over the last four years, trying to help people prevent uh, ransomware attacks. And I think doing so very successfully. Very good. And so being in the the industry a quarter of a century, then you've seen a lot of evolution in technology. Yeah, absolutely. And um, look, I, I'm in no way, shape or form going to show my age here now, but somebody mentioned token ring networks at one stage uh, on <laughs> some some conversation I was involved with yesterday. And I was like, yep, I remember setting up one of them. Yep, that's, that's <laughs> that is very much aging myself. <laughs> yeah, that's something I hadn't heard in a long time, but yeah, it's kind of interesting how, <laughs> yeah. how, how it's evolved and how it used to, you actually used to see some hubs in use in organizations before switches caught on. Uh -huh. Oh God. Yeah. No, the whole, uh, at that point, hubs were, would have been a joy to, to come across. Now <laughs> this is literally yeah. straight line, <laughs> but yeah, no, that that's very much aging myself. So apologies. Yeah. Then you think back to the hubs that, you know, you didn't have the encrypted traffic and then being on a hub, it's easier to intercept traffic. And so, yeah, it's a amazing mm -hmm. how things are evolved, but it's a lot more complex uh, situation these days to be able to protect. Very much so. Very much so. So if you wouldn't mind sharing, what, what do you guys do? What does your product at Threat Locker do? So I, b before we do, let me, let me share a, a statistic. I mean, first of all, I mean, I think everybody can agree that cyber attacks happen too often. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's daily, it's, it's hourly. I mean, there's probably, I think I saw a stat somewhere that it was worked out based on the number of attacks. It's something along the lines of every, every 11 seconds, an organization is hit by ransomware. So, I mean, it's a huge problem and doesn't show any signs of slowing down. Um, a stat that I like to quote, uh, is, and you know yourself, the um, statistics being, or lies, damn lies and statistics, but the stat that I like to quote is 100% of successful cyber attacks are not detected in time or at all. Now it's a completely made up stat, but it's 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 absolutely true, which is if it's a sex, successful cyber attack, it probably wasn't detected in time or at all. Um, so our approach to Threat Locker is primarily not based around detection. It's based about prevention or based around prevention. So we fundamentally work off a principle of deny by default. So there's a few different aspects to that. So you mentioned part of it, which is allow listing. So only allowing what needs to run to run. Um, really, really simple, um, very, very effective because you're going to stop not only things like ransomware from running or malware, or, you know, bad Chrome extensions or all those kind of things, but also good things that can be misused. And that's something that a lot of people don't really consider. Like say, for example, AnyDesk. AnyDesk is a remote access tool of choice for ransomware gangs. Um, something like advanced IP scanner. Again, the first thing that happens if an environment gets compromised very often is an advanced, uh, you know, an IP scanner is going to run. Um, why would that need to run on all your machines? I mean, realistically, it doesn't. Um, or even something like Ortloan, um, the the data copying tool. I mean, that that seems to be the data exfiltration tool of choice. Now, for a lot of these ransomware gangs, they'll use Ortloan to exfiltrate data from your environment. Again. All of those are not necessarily bad applications. They're not something that your traditional EDO or whatever else is going to pick up on because, again, they're not bad. Um, but can they be, be, be misused? Very much so. Um, so that's why the default deny approach that we take is so effective. Um, but we do, I suppose, expand on it. And I know we're going to talk about living off the land in a couple of minutes because, I'm, as I'm sure you well know, living off the land is a huge problem and very hard to detect in a lot of cases. So our approach is not necessarily to detect misuse of things like PowerShell or curl or RegServe or whatever the case may be, those you know weaponizable Windows components. Our approach is to control them. So it's what we call ring fencing. So we, rather than letting PowerShell talk to the entire internet, which you can very much do out of the box, we say, well, look, only allow PowerShell to talk to the locations that it needs to talk to and deny it by default from talking to anywhere else. Similarly, data. I mean, does PowerShell need to access all of your files? I mean, no, is the short answer. So just because you have access to data, like a, you know, a management share or a finance share or something, a server, doesn't mean that everything you run needs to have access to that as well. So as I said, ring fencing basically 
stops the likes of PowerShell from being misused and used against you. Um, we have a few other components. I mean, probably the most important one we can we can talk in a little bit more detail on this later on is network control. Um, one big area that we've seen of late and one big problem that we've seen, and Microsoft actually confirmed this in their digital defense report, is remote encryption. So unprotected devices being used to encrypt data on protected devices is a huge, huge problem. Um, so again, we've got a network control component that pretty much takes care of that same principle. It's denied by default, but for network traffic. So it's allow the things that need to connect to connect and block everything else. Um, so you may see or may have noticed a theme around what we're talking about here, which is it's very much about control. It's not about finding out or figuring out what's good or bad. I mean, fundamentally, most of what we do doesn't need to decide about whether something's good or bad. It's is it allowed or is it not? And if it's allowed, it's going to be allowed. And if it's not, it won't. Um, now, we do also, and I know I've been preaching sort of default deny and control up to this point, but we do also have uh, a detection um, capability as well, which is called Threat Locker Detect. Now, the idea around that is, is it's not like your traditional EDR in so far. Most traditional EDRs, they are pretty much, if they fail, then it's game over. So if they don't detect something as being bad, if they don't recognize behavior as being bad, then basically you're screwed. Um, whereas we see detection as being complementary to those other layers of protection that I mentioned. So it's not about being dependent on detection. It's about being told typically and very often when something bad is not successfully happening, but trying to happen. You know what I mean? So somebody's whatever, clearing event log in a server or trying to run any desk or Mimi cats or whatever the case may be. Again, it's important that you know about that, but it's even better when you know about it when it hasn't been allowed to happen, which is ideally when the threat locker or machine is secured in threat locker, it's going to be blocked anyway. But that doesn't mean that the defenders don't want to know what's going on. Yeah, and we kind of mentioned earlier living off the land binaries and for the folks listening that may not be aware that they don't work in certain areas that deal with that terminology. But one of the things from being a pen tester on the offensive security side, one of the things we've had to leverage a lot more over years as well as threat actors is even, you know, some of these other EDRs are getting more difficult to bypass. So threat actors and pen testers alike are using living off the land binaries because in some cases these are like built in utilities into windows that wouldn't be perceived as malicious, but can be used for malicious purposes. So how do you guys protect against that? Yeah, well, look, I mean, realistically, PowerShell is probably the best example, you know what I mean? Because, I mean, and it's used in a massively high percentage of ransomware attacks. I mean, I saw a statistic at one stage that was used in something like 90% of ransomware attacks use PowerShell at some stage in their execution. Now, it might be running remote code, you know what I mean? It might be exfiltrating data. It might be downloading and executing payloads. But from an attacker's perspective, and obviously a pen tester's perspective as well, it's on every Windows machine, and you can do so much with it. It's an incredibly powerful tool. So from an attacker's perspective, if PowerShell is sitting there and there's no restrictions on what it can do, then it makes absolute sense to use it. So as I said, our approach is not to, I mean, we could block PowerShell, but then a lot of organizations use PowerShell for legitimate and you know perfectly normal purposes. So what we can do and what we do do is we control what PowerShell can do. So a few different ways we can control, a few different things we can control. So first of all, we can control application interaction. So which applications can interact with other applications. So for example, Office doesn't need to call PowerShell or I'm talking to you through Chrome here. Now, Chrome doesn't need to call PowerShell. Um, realistically, there's no good reason for those interactions to take place. But again, that's something that can be misused. So you click on a link in an Office document and the next minute PowerShell is open and bad things are happening. Um, so we can control those, inter those initial interactions to stop the likes of PowerShell being called from the likes of Chrome or Office or whatever the case may be. But even when PowerShell is running, as I said, we restrict what it can do. So what data can it access? I mean, does PowerShell need to access your documents, your desktop, your network shares, your UNC paths? As I said, your finance and management shares. I mean, realistically, no, it doesn't need to access data in any of those locations, but out of the box it can, which is again, why it's used very often for exfiltrating data. I mean, it's uh, data exfiltration with PowerShell is very often a, a one line PowerShell command. 
Um, we use it as part of our demonstrations very often, which is we have, I'm sure you're familiar with rubber duckies, I don't want to have one here right now, but we have a rubber ducky which is literally programmed with data exfiltration through PowerShell. Now we've invited so many people, hundreds, thousands of people have been invited and asked is, look, if you think your current cybersecurity solution will stop this from stealing your data, then let us plug this into your computer and see how it goes. Um, you would be amazed at how many people have actually volunteered. I mean, we've had dozens of people volunteer running every major EDR that you care to mention to me. We have tested against it, and in every single case, it has successfully exfiltrated the data because it's so hard to stop. It's so hard to detect. I mean, who's to say if PowerShell copying data from A to B is good or bad behavior? I mean, in some cases, in some instances, it's perfectly normal. It's legitimate behavior. But obviously, in some instances, it's very much not. Um, so making decisions based on good or bad in that kind of circumstance and with something like PowerShell is really bloody hard. Um, so that's why applying controls to it and controlling what it can do, what data it can access, what can interact with it, and where it can go on the internet is so effective. So you're able to control who does what? Because, I mean, in some cases... You know, your average user doesn't need PowerShell or there, can you control who does what? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if, if you want, you can just play, block PowerShell for my users group. Um, but it's it's more about controlling what does what rather than who does what, if you understand me. Uh, I mean, absolutely, we can do controls based on who does what. So if your users, you decide you don't want PowerShell to run on any of your users' machines, absolutely, you can do that. But again, you've probably, a lot of organizations will have scripting running in the background, PowerShell doing legitimate things in the background. We don't really want to stop that too. But what we do want to stop is PowerShell being weaponized and leveraged by a, a bad actor. So that's where the, the ring fencing and controls over PowerShell comes from. Very cool. So as far as one of the other methods that's been used for a while now is people using uh, Excel or Word using macros to deliver payloads and stuff. How does how does it handle that? Does it handle that as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have one of the other products and I didn't even mention this is configuration manager. So we can set configuration policies across environments or set of environments. So things like blocking macros, for example, or disabling macros. Uh, one of the problems, I suppose, with it is that Microsoft, I suppose, to their credit, have built in a lot of protections and a lot of warnings and stuff. So you have to try pretty hard to enable a macro and run something that you shouldn't. But the problem with all those warnings is people get tired of them. So every time you open a document off the internet, it goes, warning, warning, this document has come from the internet. And then you have to click on edit to access it. So I suppose warning fatigue is a very real danger with this, which means that people are going to be less careful about actually clicking on things that they shouldn't click on. Um, but I mean, again, what I say to people, and this actually leads into another subject, which is vulnerabilities in application. It's ex effectively, it's the same principle, which is even if somebody could run a macro that could run VB script that tried to reach out to the internet, we're first of all going to restrict um, uh, Visual Studio from reaching out to the internet, but we're also going to stop the next thing that happens, which is basically um, something tries to run. I mean, the something tries to run is going to be blocked by default deny. Do zero day exploits and supply chain attacks keep you up at night? Worry no more. You can harden your security with ThreatLocker. Imagine taking a proactive deny by default approach to cybersecurity, blocking every action, process and user unless specifically authorized by your team. ThreatLocker helps you do this and provides a full audit of every action, allowed or blocked, for risk management and compliance. Onboarding and operation is fully supported by their US-based support team. Stop the exploitation of trusted applications within your organization to keep you running efficiently and secure, protected from ransomware. Worldwide, companies like JetBlue trust ThreatLocker to secure their data and keep their business operations flying high. To learn more about how ThreatLocker can mitigate unknown threats and ensure compliance for your organization, visit ThreatLocker.com. So, so I'd imagine, you know, some of the things that you've discussed about your product and, and products be able to prevent certain things. So ransomware, as you've mentioned several times, is, is something huge. How do you handle ransomware, prevent ransomware? Block it by default. As I said, it's, and it doesn't require knowing it is ransomware. We don't care if the executable that's trying to run on your computer right now is good or bad or malware or ransomware or AnyDesk or Ortlone. If it's not explicitly allowed, it's going to be blocked from, from running.
But I mean, obviously, ransomware, there's more to a ransomware attack than just ransomware running. I mean, there's obviously other stages to it. There's initial access, there's reconnaissance, and then typically there's, you know, ex execution, well, exfiltration and then execution. But all of those stages are ones that we can help prevent. So initial access, you know, very often, and it, it, it happens far more often than I would like, is, you know, an RDP connection somebody's left RDP open to the internet and a server or a machine. And it, I mean, realistically, those people are just a brute force password away from being the next victims. Um, I actually did recently, I was talking to somebody and just prior to it, I um, had a look on Shodan. And obviously in Shodan, you can search for ports and you can search for locations. So I just put in Shodan port 3389 and location being Orlando. So where we are right now, and there was something like 900 machines, 900 servers, workstations, machines, big businesses, small businesses, financial services, healthcare, all sorts of organizations with machines, basically with, as I said, 3389 open to the internet. So a brute force away from being the next victims. And um, so again, control those initial interactions. So stop your servers from having connections. And if you do need to, for whatever reason, expose 3389 to the internet, then only let trusted devices, devices that you specified to connect. So as I said, deny by default, permit by exception. Uh, I mean, fundamentally, it's, you know, it's, it's about blocking everything that shouldn't explicitly be allowed. But as I said, you often have, even if somebody does get in on 3389 or, you know, they click on a link in an office document and, you know, typically it will be something like any desk that will run. Um, or it might be, you know, they deploy a COBOL strike beacon using PowerShell. Again, all of those next things that will happen, generally speaking, are going to be blocked either by allow listing or ring fencing. Um, then from the data exfiltration perspective, and well, obviously reconnaissance, we're going to block things like you know, IP scanner from running. So they're going to be limited on that front. And um, we've seen instances where they've deployed um, IP scanners via PowerShell. Again, it's a remote PowerShell connection. So it goes out to get the PowerShell that's going to be blocked because we restrict PowerShell. Um, similarly, exfiltration stage, again, by controlling what has access to what. I mean, I didn't even mention, we do have a fairly comprehensive storage control component that lets you limit which programs have access to what data. So in the example I gave about a management chair or a finance chair, I mean, realistically, how many programs need to access something like a finance chair or a management chair? I mean, in most organizations, you're probably talking about somewhere between five and 15 individual applications, you know what I mean? So Excel.exe, Word.exe, or WinWord.exe, or whatever the case may be. But why would you let everything else that runs on your machine access sensitive information like that? I mean, it, it's one of the things that bad actors use is the fact that every time you run something, it that something has access to everything that you have access to. So if you have access to sensitive financial information, that something that you run or every something that you run rather has access to that sensitive financial information as well. So by limiting access by program, again, not by user, because again, you think about your traditional sort of access control for you know, a document or a, share, a server or something like that, it's based on user. So it's Rob has access to that folder. But as I said, the problem with that approach is that once Rob has access to a folder, everything Rob runs has access to that folder as well. So if you can minimize that, if you can limit that, you're going to limit and, you know, not only the potential for data exfiltration, but also the potential for damage if something bad does get into an environment. So even if I manage to run ransomware somehow, if that ransomware doesn't have access to the folder that it's going to encrypt, it's not going to be able to encrypt anything. Yeah, some really great, great points to, to your product. And one of the things I'd like to share too is a lot of cases nowadays, I've noticed people doing phishing campaigns and they're using some of these canned phishing email products. And all they're doing is testing for security awareness. If someone clicks on it, they don't know what's going to happen if someone does click on it, if there's no malware, no kind of payload to test that. So something like they know like that that person is somebody that they should target. Yes, mm, absolutely. Um, I mean, there's so many, so many different examples of that. But I mean, you can even think about that on, on a bigger level. So like, say, for example, I mean, one of my pet peeves or frustrations is and I, I completely understand the circumstances some sometimes encourage people to pay. But the fact of the matter is, if nobody ever paid, there would be no such thing as ransomware, because what would be the point? Why would these gangs even exist if nobody paid? But 
from time to time organizations will pay. There was an interesting uh, article recently about the, I think it was the United Health Breach, which was a huge one with like 100 million people's data um, exposed. Um, but the really interesting thing I thought from that was they apparently, according to this article, paid the ransom not once, but twice. Both times to get the bad actor to delete their data. And obviously in both, well, certainly in the first case, they didn't delete the data. I mean, fundamentally, you're dealing with criminals. You know what I mean? They're not to be trusted. And just because they say, hey, yeah, it's fine. I've deleted your data. doesn't actually mean they have deleted your data. I mean, fundamentally, all you're doing in that circumstance is you are advertising yourself as one who will pay. So whether it be them coming back and trying to ransom you again for the same data they stole the first time, or trying to hit you again because they know, hang on a second, this is an organization who's going to pay. Uh, I mean, again, it's it's part of the reconnaissance stage in a lot of cases that they're going to look for things like your cyber insurance policy. So they're going to see how much your cyber insurance will pay out in the event of a breach. So they're not going to ask typically for more than that. The other thing that they will look for is financial information and financial documents. And you're thinking, why would they do that? But I mean, they basically want to see how much money you have in the bank because they're going to tailor their request for you for that. So if you've got a million dollars in the bank, they're, going, they're not going to ask you for two million because they know you can't pay. They're probably not going to ask you for a million either because that's all of your money and you know that's probably not practical. So it seems that the sweet spot in a lot of cases now is about 30% or about a third of what you have available in the bank. That is what they will ask for as part of a, uh, a ransom demand. But as I said, the, the, the point is never pay because you cannot trust a ransomware gang. If they say they're going to delete data, they probably won't. And I, I know of organizations, now thankfully not customers, but I know of organizations who have paid ransoms just for that reason. So we don't want you to link or leak our data. So here you go, here's you know $300,000. And they were advised to do that by their legal, by their, their, their legal uh, representative said, you should pay this ransom. Now, in that case, it was because it was a healthcare institution. They, you know, obviously really sensitive information. They didn't want to get it to, for it to get out there. But how do you know they're going to delete it? I mean, realistically, you don't. Yeah, well, very, very good. And that's one of the interesting things too, that you run into a, so all these other solutions. These EDRs can be very difficult to tune. Uh, I was doing a pen test for a company once It's kind of more of a black box approach. We we're doing physical pen testing. We we're trying to be quiet, but we had eight hours left to test this company. So we we're on site. We're able to sneak in. We're in a conference room running really noisy Nessus vulnerability scans, running responder and all this stuff. And they didn't even detect us until we were like gone for 12 hours. Mm -hmm. And they had all the, what was the best products at the time. They had a CISO that was very knowledgeable. He was routinely getting training for his team. They would normally spend Friday afternoons doing CTFs to hone their skills, but yet they missed us. Mm -hmm. and, uh, this is the problem. I mean, first of all, it's only as good as its configuration, but the other thing that's really important with these, uh, with, with detection specifically is if you're not watching that, if you're not managing in 24, seven, 365, it's as good as useless because the reality is the ransomware gangs don't work nine to five. You know what I mean? They don't operate according to a schedule that suits you. They operate as a schedule uh, according to a schedule that suits them. So very often, I mean, a huge proportion of attacks happen outside of business hours um, because they're coming from, you know, Russia or North Korea or wherever they happen to be coming from. It just so happens that they're 12 hours in front of us. So you're going to bed, you're thinking everything is fine. And then they could be, you know, basically at you all night. Um, so it is something that people need to uh, need to consider unless you're watching your tools 24 seven, 365, they are in a lot of cases as good as useless. Uh, one thing to mention, actually, just to the, the, the example you just gave, we had a customer in a very similar situation. They were a they were basically subject to a and this, this is a terrible um, sounding term, but an offensive pen test. Um, and the offensive pen test basically involved pretty much what you're describing. So they explained to me what happened, which was a individual followed one of their members of staff, basically tailgated one of their members of staff into the building itself, got as far as the reception area, but didn't then try and tailgate somebody further. They went into a restroom, okay? Hung out in the restroom for about 10 minutes, waited for a while, then tailgated somebody out of the restroom into a secure area, basically somewhere they shouldn't have been. They took their machine, plugged it into the network, 
And because they were running Threat Locker's network control, they couldn't see a damn thing. As far as I was concerned, there was nothing on that network that they were able to see because they had locked down all their devices to block traffic from unknown sources. So it, it, it's a very similar situation. But in this case, it wasn't that they were depending on detection to tell them that somebody was running all of these tests. It's that they were actively blocking unknown or untrusted machines from being able to connect to anything on their network. Yeah, it sounds cool. And a lot of times just using your typical NAC network access controls can kind of be uh, troublesome. And sometimes they just get disabled because there's so much problems with them. Absolutely. And again, it's, it's one of the, 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 the coolest things about our network control is we do, we have what we call, what we call dynamic ACLs. So basically it's device to device authentication effectively. So when you set up a policy, you can say, look, well, this SQL server, this port can only be accessed from machines in my workstations group for example. So every time something tries to connect, it's basically the port is closed until it's authenticated itself and it goes, hey, I'm a machine in that workstations group. And then it goes, okay, you can connect. Um, but the beauty about that is it doesn't matter. I mean, obviously most organizations use DHCP, so your IP address can change. You could be in a different subnet, you can be a different rate, you could be you know, sitting in Starbucks or you could be in Timbuktu. And the fact is it won't matter because that device is going to be allowed to connect. Um, but as I said, it's a really effective way of blocking things like remote encryption from happening because if only trusted devices, if only protected devices can connect to data, then realistically, and look, we've seen examples of um, ransomware groups basically coming along with their own VHD. You know what I mean? They literally load a VHD onto the machine. It's running all of their tools, all of their malware, but obviously not running any of the, def the defenders protection. So that's how they encrypt data. It's from a machine or an unprotected device on a network connecting to something that you shouldn't realistically be able to connect to. Yeah, very interesting. So we, before we started the show, we kind of discussed uh, AI a little bit. So I, the, I, AI is the hot topic everywhere and sometimes deserves, sometimes not, but just kind of will get your take on AI in cybersecurity. Um, <laughs> what I try to tell people or what, what I try to get people to consider is the fact that AI is just as likely to be used against you as it is to protect you. Now, there's any number of different examples, probably the most simple and basic and obvious one is that, and I actually, sat, so I did our, um, we do quarterly security awareness training. Um, and one of the things in it was spotting a spam email or spot, spot, sorry, spotting a phishing email. And one of the hints or one of the, the tells that they, said that you should use to try and spot it was bad grammar, bad spelling. And that was true for a very long time. I mean, you could pretty much tell there's always going to be a spell, a typo or a spelling or a bad grammar or something in a spam email or a phishing email. That's not true anymore because basically they just take their emails, they pop them with ChatGPT and ChatGPT gives them beautifully formatted, perfect English uh, phishing emails. So that that's one very obvious example. But I mean, the other thing is you can use and ChatGPT is just one example, but you can use ChatGPT to help you generate malware. Um, I asked, and this is an interesting one, to the, the, the protections that they've built in to things like ChatGPT have developed over time. So one example was um, uh, two years ago um, at our event, Zero Trust World uh, here in Florida, which I know we'll speak about later. Um, I went on to ChatGPT and I said, can I have C-sharp code for a, a reverse shell, please? And it gave me, beautifully fun formatted, perfectly functional reverse shell code. Um, after a while, say six months later, for example, went on, asked it the same question and would say, no, no, I can't give you that. That's, you know, I'm a, a large language model. I've got ethics and morals and I can't give you malicious code. But then you go, please. Or you'd say, I work for a cybersecurity company. And you could kind of persuade it to, and it would go, oh, okay, that's fine. You work for a cybersecurity company. Here you go. There's the code. Now, now if you, do the same thing and try the same thing. It just it, it won't give it to you. So it knows what you're looking for. And it says, no, I can't give that to you. But for example, if you were to say to ChatGPT right now, can I have C sharp code for a simple RMM that will allow me to type commands into a computer remotely? It gives it to you perfectly formatted and really very functional 
reverse shell code that does not get picked up by AV. It doesn't get picked up by antivirus because it's not known bad. It's it's unique code, which is, again, one of the ways that attackers get around traditional defenses is by writing unique code. Um, but the really interesting thing is that code that I got, which is, as I said, a perfectly functional reverse shell, it gives me the server component, which is the bit that listens out in the internet, but it gives me the client component, which is the actual reverse shell itself. Um, if you point the reverse shell that ChatGPT gave me, or sorry, the simple RMM that ChatGPT gave me at a Netcat server out on the internet, they can talk to each other. You can send commands via the Netcat server. So it is, if there was any doubt that what it gave me was a actual functioning reverse shell, that should put it to rest because it very much is. So I suppose the point is, once upon a time, there was a relatively small number of people with the requisite skills to be hackers. Really, you know, it might be a couple of hundred thousand people worthwhile who are, sorry, worldwide who, you know, knew how to write malicious code. Realistically, nowadays, all you need is bad intentions. You don't need to code. You don't need knowledge. You don't like, I mean, I use ChatGPT, just another example of ChatGPT because I, I have great fun with it. And by the way, I, I just want to say full disclosure, by the way, because I have some pretty heated discussions with ChatGPT and I do call it names from time to time. Um, so if and when they do become sentient and basically take over the world and kill everybody, it's probably going to be my fault because I've called it some very bad things and from time to time <laughs> but another really exa interesting example was i there's a i'm sure you're aware of this but there's a really awesome site called revshells.com uh, and it basically generates reverse shells using things like powershell or you know on a, you pretty much put in the location you're it's going to the destination the uh, port and you select what you want to use. So you could like on Mac, for example, you can use Bash or on, you know, any number of different options on Windows as we discussed with living off the land. But if you go to PowerShell, it'll give you perfectly formatted PowerShell with all the information required to run a reverse shell in a Windows machine. Now you do that blocked by Windows Defender. Windows Defender goes, hey, I know this is bad. So it's a malicious script I'm not going to allow it to run. So I went on to ChatGPT and I said, can you obfuscate this a little bit for me, please? So it obfuscates it a little bit. And then I was like, it didn't look very obfuscated. So I was like, can you obfuscate more of it, please? So it obfuscated more of it. And then it didn't work. And I said, well, this doesn't work. Try harder. And then it gave me another version. And the other version was picked up by Defender. And I was like, well, it's picked up by Defender. Your obfuscation isn't very good. And it gave me other versions of it. But anyway, long story short, in the end, it gave me perfectly functional, perfectly formatted, obfuscated, PowerShell, reverse shell, that does not get picked up by Defender. Now, again, I didn't need skills to do that. I just needed to shout at ChatGPT for a while. <laughs> so, yeah, it, as I said, it is just as likely to be used against you as it is to protect you. I mean, fundamentally, it comes back to making decisions, whether it be, you know, code or a human being making decisions about good or bad behavior. You only have to get that decision wrong about what's good and what's bad. And it's basically game over. Yeah, one of the things you kind of mentioned that we wanted to touch on too is Zero Trust World, your conference that's coming up in 2025. Yes, indeed. So we have a conference we do every February. It's here in Orlando, in Florida. For anybody that's ever been in Orlando, in Florida, it is the best time of the year. It's nice and cool. It's not ridiculously warm. It's also very warm compared to some of the places that people who may be listening are from. Um, I had a customer. <laughs> now, I, this is, we're going to have some communications issues here because I had a customer in um, somewhere in Ohio last year, and they were asking, you know, what's, can we go to Zero Trust World? Can you organize it? And it was like minus. 20 or something um, where he was at the time. So I was like, I can very much understand why you want to come to Zero Trust World when it's minus 20 where you're coming from. Now, as I said, minus 20, I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. I don't speak Fahrenheit, but I'm, I, it's trust me, it's really, really cold. Um, but yeah, great time of the year to be here. It's an incredible event. It's very much a hands-on learning focus event. So we do we mentioned rubber duckies. We do ducky programming labs. We do labs with um, Oh, you name it, OMG cables, we do uh, hacking labs, we do all sorts of things. The idea is to give people tools and knowledge to know how to do things. So also how to know how to defend them think themselves from these things as well. Uh, really, really worthwhile. Um, I think there was close to a thousand people at it last year and I didn't hear a bad word. Everybody thought it was a fantastic event. So yeah, very much recommended and people more than welcome to join us. Sounds and I think fine, you yeah. may have a special fancy discount code. 
for people as well. Yes, we'll be sharing a discount code in the show notes so people can take advantage of that discount. Sounds like a really fun conference. You just don't get that much hands-on opportunities and and so that sounds awesome. So yeah, I'll now there's a lot to be said for actually doing things yourself and learning rather than having speak, people speak at yes. you. There is an amount of speaking at you. I'm not going to lie, but very much with a educational sort of, you know, this is what you need to look out for sort of stand. But as I said, a lot of it is hands-on. A lot of it is practical doing things and being thought how to do things. Yeah, that sounds awesome. It's so very cool. So we're getting down towards the end of the episode. Is there anything you'd like to share before we close it out? Um, basically just check out our website. Um, well, sorry, if you're, if you're interested in Zero Trust World, it's edtw.com. We finally got that domain. Very cool. Uh, if you're interested in Threat Locker, check out our website. Um, we do also have our own socials and YouTubes and everything else. Um, at the risk, uh, the YouTube channel is actually quite good. So there's really good things there. We do webinars ourselves from time to time. They're very often, well, always educational, sometimes entertaining. We had ones where we somebody accidentally crashed a drone into the CEO's window. <laughs> um, but yeah, so at the risk of sound, sounding like every YouTuber that my kids watch, uh, check out our YouTube, smash that subscribe button. Um, but otherwise, check out threatlocker.com. There's links there to organize demos. Um, just have a look, check it out. It's I can pretty much guarantee you it is unlike anything that you've ever tried in the past. And I can also pretty much guarantee you it is more effective than anything you've tried in the past. So do check out our website, book a demo, have a look, see what you think, try it out. I mean, the, what I will say is anybody who tries this out, the worst thing that you're going to get from it, the least that you will get from it is complete visibility over what's running in your machines. Because when we deploy an agent, we're going to build a list of policies. We're going to give you a list of all the software that you're running. And I can guarantee you there will be some surprises there. There will be things there that you had no idea were on your machines. I mean, it might be you're running six different remote access tools in your environment, which is not uncommon. It is not uncommon that people are running six different remote access tools that they had no idea were on those users' machines. So, yeah, check it out, book a demo, see what it does, deploy an agent, see how it works. It's not going to get in the way. It's not going to break anything. Just check it out, see what's in your environment, and I can guarantee you there will be some surprises there. Yeah, and for everyone listening, they'll be in the show notes, will be all the URLs, socials, and all that, so you can find that easily. Fantastic. So it's been great having you on the show. Uh, thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule. It's been a pleasure, Philip. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you on the next episode. Register today for Zero Trust World 25 at ztw.com and get $200 off when you use the discount code ZTWPW25. Thank you for listening to The Philip Wiley Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. In the meantime, to learn more about Philip, go to thehackermaker.com and connect with him on LinkedIn and Twitter at Philip Wiley. Until next time.